And you never saw him again? Never. But I'm sure it was Krugman. You'd be willing to testify that if I managed to find him? Of course. But now I must go. I can't tell you how grateful I am you agreed to see me. It's beginning to think I was chasing a ghost. Unfortunately, he's very much alive. Au revoir, Captain Berman. Au revoir. Merci. I've said all night. Something about Cleveland? You're back in your Dita Krugman mode, aren't you? It's that obvious, huh? David, I know how badly you want to find Krugman. I mean, I know that's why you swung a transfer here. I know he did something terrible to your family. But for God's sake, you've only been in Paris a few months, and the man's been missing for 45 years. You didn't expect it to be easy, did you? Of course not. Besides, but... you can't even be sure that Washington tip is valid in the first place. No, Krugman is alive, all right, and he's living somewhere here in Paris. That tip came straight from my friend at the OSI. Well, I've worked at the embassy for two years, and I don't know what that is. It's the Office of Special Investigations. They're the guys that track down Nazis living in the States. Anyhow, Elsa Ramsey was a Midenex survivor, and she saw Krugman here not more than a week ago. I never heard much about Midenex. Was it like Auschwitz? Uh, smaller, but yeah, just as bad. Anyhow, maybe this Elsa Ramsey made a mistake and it wasn't him. Then why was she murdered? Well, you don't know. She was. It could have been an accident. No, no. She spots Krugman, tells the Surete. I talked to her and 15 seconds later she's dead. That's no accident. Anyhow, I mean, I saw it. That car deliberately ran her down. Say you're right, that Krugman is here. If you keep after him, you could wind up splattered all over the street or something. I don't want that to happen. She saw her mother and father. My grandparents, you understand? She saw them taken to the gas chambers. And her two brothers murdered, I mean, right in front of her eyes. Krugman would have killed her, too, if he had the chance. As it is, he pretty well left her crippled for life. I'm sorry, I didn't know. In fact, she just had another operation on her legs. I couldn't tell you how many that makes. It's funny, when I was a little kid, I used to think my mother lived at the hospital and just came to our house to visit. But how do you possibly expect to find him? You don't even know what he looks like, right? No, no one's ever seen a picture of him, even from when he was young. So, all you have is a sort of a rough description from your mother, and she was what? 13 years old at the time? I know it is not going to be easy. If it was easy, they would have found him years ago. But I have to keep looking. I just, I just have to. Can't you understand that? Of course. I just don't want to see you overshadow everything else in your life. Like us, for instance. Captain Berman, please. You will join me in the van. What the hell are you talking about? I'm afraid I must insist. I assure you I mean you no harm. David, don't. Don't be afraid. Captain Berman will be returned home safely. Now, hurry, please. Okay, I think you better tell me what's going on. I must apologize to you for what may seem as cheap melodrama, but sometimes we are forced to take extreme measures. Yeah, who the hell is we? You do not need to know that. All you need to know, Captain, is that like you, for years we also have been searching for Dieter Krugman. And we believe now that he is here in Paris. Where is he? He goes by the name of Altman, Felix Altman. 
a successful businessman. Well, if you're so sure he's Krugman, why don't you go to the police? He's a wanted war criminal. Because as yet we lack sufficient evidence. All we have are rumors and one inconclusive photograph. A photograph? We believed we also had an eyewitness, the same one you had, Elsa Ramsey. Look, if uh, you and uh, who you work with, if you're so sure you've got Krugman, then why don't you just find another Maidenek survivor that can make the identification? Because the death camp at Maidenek was just that, Captain. A death camp. Survivors were not the end product. That is why we need your help, Captain Berman. Me? We have sources at the police at the Surete. They told us of your interest in Krugman. We investigated and learned that your mother is a Maidenek survivor. We would like you to bring her to Paris so she can make the identification. I don't know. When can I see that photograph? A rare picture. It has obviously changed in 45 years. Which is why we need your mother's testimony. Where can I see him? You can't see him at home or in his office. He refuses to see strangers. But we have learned that every Thursday morning he goes to a mineral spa outside the city. Where is this spa? It's called L'Eau de Dieu. It is near Barbizo. I'll go tomorrow. You have a car? I can borrow one. How do I contact you? We will contact you. And now you're free to go, just as I promised the young lady. Major's a good guy. I just said I had some urgent personal business, and he gave me the day off. Oh, I still don't think you should go. I mean, if he is Krugman, then he's a very dangerous... Look, we talked that all out. I've got to go. I want to see what he looks like. That's all I want, really. You sure it's okay about the car? Yeah, as long as you don't go over 110. I'll have to pack my five. Maybe I should cop an urgent personal business plea, too, and go along with you. Well, I can probably get away, too. No, it's my problem. I'll deal with it. It's better I go along. Really. Here's the quickest way to get there. But make nice, huh? It's a classy joint. Come on, I'll show you where I parked the car. And you better get back to work. Don't worry. I'll be okay. Monsieur Rondeau, oui, le 26, donc de 15h30 à 17h30. Parfait. Oui. Uh, Parlez anglais? Uh, yes, I do. I have a message for Mr. Felix Altman. If you go through that door and down the stairs, you will find Mr. Altman in room 8. What you want here? Out with it. It's not important. If you have something to say to me, then say it. I have nothing to say to you. I think you do. You want to talk about my Dinek? Leave us, please. Who are you? How did you get in here? 
doesn't matter. Ah, but I think it does matter. No, what matters, Herr Krugman, Krugman? is what you did at Meidenek. What are you talking about? You know what I'm talking about. My name is Altman. Felix Altman. Please, don't lie to me. I've seen your picture. You're Dieter Krugman. No, man, not a fool. <laughs> la police. It's been over three years, Perry. Not since Dan's funeral. I know, Helene, and I'm sorry. We've been too long apart. No. No apologies necessary. But too long friends for that. Besides, I never contacted you either. There's still no excuse. <laughs> Stan will always be my closest friend. He always said you were the one who got him through law school. No. No, in class, he always took the best notes. But you. How are you? Fine. They tell me I'll be out of here in a few days. Same old problem? Now it's my hip. All the pressure from the bad leg. All right, Elaine. Why did you call me? You remember our son, David. Of course I remember it. Well, now he's a captain with the Marines. He's attached to the American Embassy in Paris. Not a bad assignment. He's being charged with murder. Tell me. He is accused of killing Dieter Krugman. The Nazi? The one from Meidenek? The, uh, the one who did that? Could you help him, Perry? France has a different code of law. I don't, I don't even speak the language. He, he told me on the telephone. He thinks maybe he'll be turned over to the military. Or a court martial. My associate will be on his way to Paris tomorrow morning. I'll join him day after. Oh, Perry, thank you. Thank you. In the first place, why did you go out there? Because after all these years, I, I had to see him in the flesh. I had to know if it was really him. And it was Dieter Krugman. His wife admitted it to the press. Besides, he pretty much looked like the picture. It's funny, I was expecting to see some sort of vicious monster. All there was was this pathetic old man. You don't know where the gun came from. I didn't even see it. I guess whoever shot him just tossed it on the floor. Could it have been the man who kidnapped you, the one in the van? David, we want to know the truth, all of it. Maybe in some kind of blind rage, you actually did kill him. No. You've been hunting him for years. You've been angry for years. You wanted revenge for years. Yes, but not that kind. Then what? I wanted to expose him to the world as, as the kind of monster he was so that nobody would ever forget. What do they say? Those who don't remember the past are condemned to repeat it? Mr. Mason, my dad said that you were the best lawyer he ever knew. Will you do it? Will you represent me? You're entitled to military counsel. But I'd rather you handle it by yourself, if possible. Well, David, it's been a long time since my court-martial days. But I imagine it'll all come back. Mr. Mason. Lieutenant Fletcher, investigating officer for the court martial. How do you do? This is my associate, Ken Milansky. We've met. Mm -hmm. There's a rumor, Mr. Mason, that you're going to represent Captain Berman before the court. More than a rumor, we are. 
In that case, it's something you should know. We sent the gun that was recovered at the murder scene to Washington for testing. It arrived back this morning. And it's definitely been identified as the weapon that fired the lethal round. I would have expected that. The serial number on the gun indicates it was the 9mm automatic, issued to Captain David Berman the day he reported here for duty. Glad to help, however I can. A thing like this reflects very badly on the entire consular service, even if it only involves a single Marine. You're talking about Moscow? Well, yes. And by the way, Mr. Mason, I must tell you that I have already been interviewed by Lieutenant Fletcher, and I'm afraid I had to tell him the truth. Good. The truth is that it was common knowledge within the embassy that Captain Berman had this Obsession, you'd have to call it, about finding Krugman. Mr. Ambassador, thank you. Please send Mr. Mitchell in. I'll hear some tangible help I can offer. Ah, Mr. Mitchell, come in, please. I want you to meet Mr. Perry Mason and Mr. Ken Milansky. They'll be representing Captain Berman at the court-martial. Gentlemen, this is Kurt Mitchell of our American Services Division. Good to meet you. Hi. Mr. Mitchell is a close friend of Captain Berman. And I'm assigning him to you while you're here. He can also arrange to get you some clerical help. You speak French and German, don't you, Kurt? Enough so that I'm not intimidated by the waiters. And enough to cut through a lot of bureaucratic red tape. Great. Since Della couldn't make the trip, Kurt can take her place. Della? I hope the change in gender won't be a problem. I think we can make the adjustment. But, yes, you can help us, Mr. Mitchell. Gladly, but please call me Kurt. All right, Kurt. Mr. Milansky has the names of some people we'd like to talk to. I need their addresses and their phone numbers. Is that people within the embassy? Oh, no. Potential witnesses. Altman's widow, the masseur at the spa, the family of that woman who was killed, Elsa Ramsey, and, oh, yes, one person at the embassy, uh, Kathy? Kathy. Kathy Bramwell. I'll get right on it. Now, Mr. Mason, I will do whatever I can to facilitate your stay. But I myself must maintain a totally neutral position with regard to the guilt or innocence of Captain Berman. Uh, what I mean is, I can't interfere with the progress of the court-martial. We wouldn't want it any other way, Mr. Ambassador. This is Berman's apartment. Look at this door jam. Obviously forced open. By whom, Mr. Mason? After Captain Berman left, the murderer could have broken in, found the gun, and then proceeded David to the spa. Where well, they waited for Berman to arrive and then killed Altman. Or Krugman, rather. While Berman was still in the room with him. That's right. Or Captain Berman could have forced it to open himself. So it would look exactly the way you just theorized. <laughs> Again, you're right. After all, Captain Berman knew the gun would be traced back to him. Why go to all that trouble? Why not just get another gun? Because as a foreigner, it wouldn't have been easy for him to procure one. And besides, he didn't have the time. According to his own story, he only knew Krugman was going to be there the night before. Mr. Mason, I'm afraid all this just won't help your case very much. David's goal was to bring Krugman to justice, not to kill him. Well, maybe French justice wouldn't have been enough for him. As you probably know, France doesn't have capital punishment. Is everything all right? Not really. I have those uh, telephone numbers and addresses that you requested. Well, thank you. Now I need a copy of the Uniform Code of Military Justice. I'll have one sent over to your hotel, Mr. Mason. Well, Lieutenant, thank you for all your help. No, ask anything you want. All right. All right. I know you were good friends with David's parents and all, but do you really think he didn't do it? I think he didn't do it. And as I told Lieutenant Fletcher, I think he never intended to do it. But he had a fixation and a great frustration about Krugman. Elaine told me all David ever talked about was trying to find Krugman, have him tried publicly in France, 
under the crimes against humanity laws. Yeah, but why France? Why not some other country that has capital punishment? I mean, weren't most of the Maidenac survivors Poles and Germans? There were French nationals, too, like Calais and like her whole family. That's right. So where do we start tomorrow? With the usual suspects. I'll start with Krugman's widow. You start with Kathy Bramwell. Yes, I've known for years my husband was Didier Krugman. How did you find out? Before we were married, I was helping him to move from his apartment. And by chance, I came across his identification card of Madnik. So he had to admit who he was. He swore to me he intended to tell me before we were married. He wanted no secrets between us. And then he, he burned the identification card. He warned me people would always be looking for him. Madame Altman, did you know the kind of man Dieter Krugman was? I knew the kind of man people thought he was. And still you married him? You did not know Felix, Mr. Mason. He was a kind and decent man. It is impossible to believe he was the monster people claim. Aside from people who were looking for Dieter Krugman, did he have any enemies? Uh, let me put it this way. Did Felix Altman have any enemies? All successful businessmen have enemies, Mr. Mason. Any who hated him enough to want him killed? Well, there is one. I don't want to say he could have done it, but he was very angry with my husband. Go on. His name is Andre Marchand. And your husband found out Andre Marchand had embezzled several million francs from the business and fired him. How did you know that? Are the police looking into this embezzlement? Yes, of course. Thank you very much for your time, Madame Altman. Mr. Mason, you do not believe the American soldier murdered Felix? No, I do not. Do you have any pictures of your husband? I have none. He was always afraid someone would see the photograph and recognize him as Krugman. He led a very fearful life, monsieur. We both did. guys do that in New York. They mime in French, then? <laughs> Touche. Hey, how about that? Practically a native. Well, I guess we better get going. You probably have to be back at your desk. Anyway, you were saying you actually got the license plate number of that van? After I drove away with David, I wrote it down on a piece of paper. At least whatever I could remember. But then when he called me later and said everything was okay, I just forgot about it. Still have that piece of paper? In my pocket. I think it's important. Could it help David? It might. I remember there were a couple of sevens and a nine. I don't know. Anyhow, I'll get it for you. Can I tell you something else? I think I've seen that same van a couple of times since. Really? Where? When I went out shopping after work the other night. Then yesterday, I... My God. There it is. No, still.
Yes, I worked for Felix Altman for over 10 years. But this isn't one of his stores. It's mine. And it took all the money I made. Three million francs. That you were told I embezzled from Altman. You see, I know what they say. But you did not do that. For the past five years, Felix wanted to make me a partner in his business. Then, two months ago, he changed his mind. Just like that. So I made him pay myself a bonus. To the franc, exactly what I would have got if he had kept his promise. I consider it a fair settlement. Of course, he found out and fired you. Yes, but that was all her doing. Madame Altman? She made him change his mind about the partnership. Why? Because she is the most greedy and cold-hearted person I have ever met. In fact, it would not surprise me to learn that she was in some way responsible for her husband's death. She said the same about you. That does not surprise me. Do you know her history, monsieur? Well, I know she'd been a dancer in the Folie Bergère, and that she was much younger than her husband. When she became too old to appear naked on the stage, she seduced the old man into marriage. Why would she want him dead? Because lately the company had been losing money and she wanted him to sell out so she could keep all her precious capital. But he refused, so now she can keep the company oh, and collect the insurance. I see. Tell me, Marchand, did you have any idea Felix Altman was really Dieter Krugman? No, but he was always a very private, very secretive man. Meanwhile, you're facing a charge of embezzlement. Which I'm sure will be withdrawn once all the facts are known. Well, they'll certainly have a harder time proving their case now that their chief witness is dead. Monsieur, I believe I am through answering your questions. Perhaps you are. Perhaps not. Excuse the way the place looks. I wasn't expecting visitors. Well, don't worry about it. Anyhow, I know exactly where I put it. Oh, my God. Maybe you weren't expecting visitors. You sure as hell had some. It's gone. The license number. They took it. Somebody is getting very proficient at breaking into apartments. It had to be the kidnapper. It would certainly look that way. Ferry thinks that your friends in the van weren't so friendly. That they might have set you up, framed you for Krugman's murder. Maybe, but whatever. I don't want you to involve Kathy anymore. She's already involved. She saw your kidnapper, and as far as they know, she saw their license numbers. Well, then you've got to protect her. We'll do everything we can. Hello, Della. Right on time. How are you? I'm just fine. How's it going over there? Still trying to sort our way through 45 years of history. Well, I suppose there's a worse place to do it. Oh, by the way, the district attorney is asking for a continuance on that Haskell case. Tell the DA it's fine with me. But did you reach the INS about Elsa Ramsey? That's what I'm really calling about. Elsa Ramsey was born in Poland, Elsa Brodsky. And later, during the war, she was in Maidanek. After that, she married a GI by the name of Arthur Ramsey. He brought her back to Ohio, to his hometown, and then later they had a baby girl named Marie. What happened to Ramsey? From all the information I can gather, he just dropped out of sight when the daughter was about 13. Where is the daughter now? She's living right there in Paris, working for a designer named Vicky Teal. Oh, that's interesting. Good work. All right, enough about business. How are you? Are you all right? 
All right. Why wouldn't I be? Well, you know when you're over there, you eat that rich food. Rich food? Here in Paris? Della, you're imagining things. Say hello for me. Ken sends his regards. Meanwhile, I'll check with you every day. Give you a cholesterol count. You're bad, Perry. Bad. Bad, bad, bad. Bye, Della. I would like you to talk to a woman named Marie Ramsey. She's Elsa Ramsey's daughter. She works for the fashion designer Vicky Teal. Find out if she has anything that might link the Krugman murder to her mother's murder. Look, I don't want to sound paranoid, but I really am worried about Kathy. If that van is following her... Don't worry, David. Two can play at that game. Um, you speak English? Probably better than I speak French. Oh. Uh, what does a dress like this go for, anyway? 8,400 francs. Ugh. Wow, that's, uh, 1,200 bucks? Closer to 14. Your name Marie Ramsey? Mm-hmm. Mind if I ask you a few questions? About the dress? About your mother. Yes, I would mind. I don't like people who make me feel like a fool. Now, wait a second. I've never been to a place like this before. I was curious about the dress. But that's not why you came in here, is it? You came in to pry about my mother. Look, I'm a lawyer from the States. I work with another attorney named Perry Mason. We're representing David Berman, the Marine who's accused of killing Dieter Krugman. And you don't think he did it? No, we don't. That's why I'm here. Maybe you better explain that. All right. We're trying to find if there's a connection between your mother's death and Krupp. He's the one who murdered her. What makes you think that? It had to be him. My mother didn't have an enemy in the world except for Dieter Krugman. And your mother thought she saw him two weeks ago on the street? She did see him. She went to the Sarate, but they said there was nothing they could do for her. But Berman had been making inquiries about Krugman, so I guess they told him and he contacted her. This is kind of personal. But after... After your father, after, after he... After he ran out on us? Why'd your mother bring you back here? Why not Poland? She couldn't face the memories. The nightmare. And she had friends here. Could you tell me about it? The nightmare? I'm afraid I have to get back to the showroom right now. I got all the time in the world. My mother was sent to Maidenek as forced labor, as a laundress. Maybe you don't know, but Maidenek wasn't like Auschwitz or Treblinka. Yeah, in what way? I mean, there was a death camp, but there was also an internment center attached to it. A concentration camp. That's where my mother worked. But Krugman was at the death camp. Yes, but because of my mother's duties, she had to go there to the other side. And Krugman was famous, if that's the word, even then. That's how she recognized him here. But how could she after 45 years? Well, she said he changed, but she could never forget his eyes. You looked into them and you actually saw the face of evil. Besides, she had a picture. A picture? Of her and a lot of the other Might Next staff, including Krugman. She said how ashamed she was being forced to pose for those animals. But she kept it because she never wanted to forget how bad life could get. Uh, look, Miss Ramsey. Uh, is it possible I could see that picture you were talking about? I've never seen it myself, and I've stored my mother's things. Yeah, it might be important. I'd have to go through the boxes tonight or in the morning. Come on, I, I'd really appreciate it. All right. I'll 
I'll come by and pick it up tomorrow. Hello? If I find it, why don't I just send it to your hotel? Molanski? No. Um, no. wait a second. That, that's me. Your name's Molanski? Molanski, Borowski. Maybe we're even related. Hello? Yeah, Perry. No kidding. Where? Okay, I'm on my way. I'll see you tomorrow. He sure must have a lot of pull with the ambassador to get me all this time off. He's being very cooperative. Anyhow, I'm so glad you're representing David. I just wish I could be of more help. If only I could remember that stupid license number. It may not be important, Kathy. But it is. This is far enough. What's far enough? Are you certain you could recognize David's kidnapper if you saw him again? Oh, sure. I mean, it was only a few seconds, but I'd know him anywhere. Look over there. A van. Why don't you give me the keys? No. See over there, the gendarme? Ah. He's been following us since we started our little walk. Well, what can we do? What we can do has been done. Let's go. That's him. That's the man who took David. What do you want? Who are you? Who do you work for? I cannot tell you that. Then perhaps you would like to tell those gendarmes over there why you engage in kidnapping and murder. We do not murder. Ken, ask some of those fellows over there to step over here, will you? Sure. No. Wait. What is it you want? I want to know who you are and what you're after and who you work for. It will take a moment. You have just one. Now, give me a bit. I've been here with David Berman's Werksanwalt. Er droht ihnen mit der Polizei, wenn er sie nichts sprechen darf. Also dann. You'll be at the Trocadero at 6.45 tonight. A car will pick you up and you will come alone. I want some identification from you. A passport, driver's license. I'll return it tonight. Carl Meyerhoff. Well, Carl Meyerhoff, if that car doesn't arrive at 6.45, the Surete will be looking for you. The car will be there. Give him back the keys. I don't like it. You're taking a big chance. I'm sure before this is over, you'll both be taking a big chance. So you asked the Surete about Meyerhoff? Yes, but so far nothing. And I'm checking up on Daniel Altman and Andre Marchand. Oh, and I have a list of the court martial brass, most of them coming in from Brussels, from NATO. Car should be. Still don't think you should go. Not alone. I agree, you don't know these people. How about Kurt and I follow behind in my car? No, if they spot you, they'll call it off. We can't take that chance. This might be it. You have a pen? Here's the number Meyerhoff punched in on his mobile phone. If I'm not back in two hours, give it to the Sorte. My orders are that you come alone. My friends just came to see me off.
Can't make out the plates. I hope he knows what he's doing. He usually does, but tonight... I don't know. Chair for our guest. Uh, no, I, I won't stay very long. You... You wanted to see me, Mr. Mason. I don't know your name. Otto Rossen. That still doesn't tell me very much. Mr. Mason, have you ever heard of the Treblinka uprising in 1943? Yes. Almost 60 prisoners escaped the death camp. And I was one of them. I lived in the woods like an animal for six months. During this time, I made a promise to God and to myself that if I survived, I would spend the rest of my life tracking down the Nazi barbarians who visited their unspeakable horrors against the world. That's what you do now? For 44 years, I've been a hunter. I worked behind the scenes with your own OSI in Washington, with my friend Simon Wiesenthal, and with others all over the world. Weisenthal and the others work out in the open, with the public. As did I, Mr. Mason, until a few years ago when our offices in West Berlin were firebombed and three of our people died. We've been obliged to go undercover since we came here in search of Krugman. I represent David Berman, charged with the murder of Dieter Krugman. I'm looking for the person who committed that murder. <laughs> you imagine it might be me or someone who works with me? Well, now that I know who you are, that conclusion doesn't seem unreasonable. Then why should we want to kill Dieter Krugman? Because he's your prey, and France does not have the death penalty. Ah, but you missed two important points. First, we could easily have arranged for Krugman to be transported to a country where there is the death penalty. He committed crimes against the humanity of many nations. In truth, we regret that Krugman is dead. If he'd been captured and put on trial, the impact on the public would have been immeasurably more powerful. And Mr. Mason, the public, the world, must never be allowed to forget. But I still don't know why you have to go in for so much cloak and dagger, so much secrecy. Because, as I told you, we had to go underground. And because Odessa has a price on my head. A very, <laughs> very flattering amount, I must admit. You've heard of Odessa, Mr. Mason? A network of ex-Nazis and Nazi sympathizers. Many people assume that Odessa is only fiction. But unfortunately, it's all too real. And its tentacles are everywhere. So this cloak and dagger you refer to is our means of preserving our security. <laughs> I'd like to see the picture of Krugman that was shown to Captain Berman. I thought you'd ask, Cal. Many of these butchers had very little trouble establishing new identities after the war. May I keep this? Of course. I know your reputation. And if Captain Berman is innocent, he has nothing to fear. I shall have you driven back to your hotel. Good night, Mr. Mason. Good night, Mr. Rosen. Hey, good morning. Bonjour. Oh, yeah, whatever. <laughs> yeah, that's really beautiful. 
Look, you don't have to keep pretending. I'm not pretending. I like it. This is the only thing you really came to see. My mother's the one on the right. Which one's Krugman? She didn't say. She never talked about it. Too painful, she said. Anyhow, you keep it as long as you need it, but I'd like it back. Do you have any plans for dinner tonight? You don't need to do that. I know I don't. But I'm a stranger in town, and I don't speak the language. And I thought it would be nice to have dinner with a fellow American, especially such a beautiful one. I don't think that's such a good idea. Besides, I'm not American. I've spent more time here than in the States. I pretty well think of myself as French. Well, then do it in the name of closer U.S.-French relations. Think of uh, Gene Kelly and Leslie Caron. OK. Dinner. But no dancing through any fountains. <laughs> Darn. I'll call you later. Well, we sure got here a lot faster than I did the other day. Just wish I hadn't come in the first place. Let's go. They're expecting us. And I was standing right here, and the shot sounded like it came from right behind me. Next thing I knew, they grabbed me and that's all I really know. So, somebody could have fired from in back of that door and escaped unseen. Everybody who came in after that shot came through that door. Where does this door lead? To a storage room. Does it have an outside entrance? Hey. Well, that's one theory, Mr. Mason. But it's a bit hypothetical to convince the court martial. Lieutenant, you were right about that today, but today is not tomorrow. The court is called for 10 a.m. Let's go. What about the fingerprints on the gun? What about them? There were no fingerprints, you know that. But doesn't that work for David? Not really. Prosecution could argue how this cold and calculating defendant carefully wiped his fingerprints from the gun as his victim lay dead at his feet. And what does that leave us with? I mean, if David didn't do it, then who did? You tell me. Daniel Altman, for the money? It's possible. We should check that insurance out. I've got some stuff on her coming in the morning. Andre Marchand? Mm -hmm. Another possible. Kurt, see if the Surete can verify his whereabouts the day of the murder. OK. But my source says he may have some other important information on Marchand. What about Meyerhoff or this Otto Rosen? No. After what you told me, they're off the list. Who else? I got no idea. Maybe somebody we don't know of yet? Maybe another Midenac survivor. There is another possibility. Who? Compare that photo with the one you got from Marie Ramsey. This one's from Rosen? Yep. It's the same face. So. Elsa Ramsey did recognize Krugman on the street and was probably killed for it. So who is this other suspect? If uh, your mother were murdered, wouldn't you want vengeance on whoever did it? By the way, Ken, how did your dinner go this evening? Perry. There's no way she could have done it. Probably not. When you return that photo, do a little digging. Whatever you say. But I can't even imagine her being involved. Nor could I. Gentlemen, the court martial starts at 10 a.m. in the morning. We'd like to speak to Madame Altman. I'm sorry. Madame Altman is in conference. I cannot be disturbed. I can see that we have an appointment, will you? No problem. 
Just a moment, monsieur. You can go in there. Actually, it's very easy. I've been here before. Remember? Hey, you'd better stay, Marchand. I'm glad to find the two of you together. It saves me a visit. What do you want? I thought we'd share some information. We're not interested. I certainly was. You see, the Surete has no report of any embezzlement by Marchand. I suspect there wasn't any. I think you'd better go now. What happened was your husband discovered that you and Marchand had been having an affair. You don't know what you're talking about. So he fired you and threatened to divorce you. If you do not go now, I will call the security. He was ashamed to let anyone around him know how he'd been betrayed, so he concocted the cover story of an embezzlement. After he was dead, it suited your purpose to let the story stand. When we talked, each of you pointed an accusing finger at the other to disguise the fact that you were lovers. Why would we do that? So nobody would guess you had a definite motive to kill your husband? And what would that be? Get him out of the way before he could divorce you. So you'd inherit whatever estate he had left, plus whatever insurance there was. The two of you would live happily ever after. It's lies, a pack of lies. Andre, please, be quiet. Mr. Mason, some of what you say is true. We are lovers. But we had nothing to do with the killing of my husband. I swear it to you. You may have to. In front of a court-martial that starts in half an hour. Bonjour. Yes, sir. As soon as the local surete was given proof that Captain Berman carried a diplomatic passport, both he and the gun found at the scene were turned over to me. And you had the gun sent on to Washington? Yes, sir, to Corps headquarters, along with the bullet taken from the deceased body. They forwarded both items to the Department of Defense, where Marine Intelligence made ballistics tests. Excuse me, Mr. President. Defense is willing to stipulate that the gun found at the murder scene was the same weapon that fired the fatal bullet. Thank you, Counselor. In that case, I have no further questions for Lieutenant Fletcher. No questions. Thank you, Lieutenant Fletcher. You may step down. Please call your next witness. Master Sergeant Frederick Hanson. The serial number on the 9mm automatic that Lieutenant Fletcher gave me corresponded to the serial number on the gun that I myself issued to Captain Berman on the 6th of August of this year. The date he reported for duty at the embassy here? You sure? I keep very careful records, sir. As a matter of fact, I brought them with me if you'd like to show them to the court. Defense will stipulate the gun that killed the deceased was the same gun issued to the defendant. Thank you, Mr. Mason. No questions, sir. No questions. Thank you, Sergeant Hanson. Colonel Calvelli, you may call your next witness. Sir, I'm afraid he isn't here yet. I didn't expect all these stipulations from the defense, and I told them 11 o'clock. Well... In that case, we'll call a short recess. Court will resume at 11.30. Colonel Calvelli, you will inform us if there are any additional schedule problems? Of course, sir. Is that good? It never hurts to rattle the other side a little. We could use a little more time. Good news, Mr. Mason. At least I think it is. There was a 10 million franc insurance policy on Altman's life, and Danielle Altman is the sole beneficiary. Interesting. But that still only goes to motive. We need a lot more. I have things to do. Lieutenant Fletcher, why don't we all get a cup of coffee? Well, Mr. Ambassador, sit down. Mr. Mason. Things don't seem to be going well. I'd like to ask you for a little help. Certainly. Perhaps someone in the State Department could contact the Soviet Procurator General's office in Moscow. The Soviets? What for? 
The Russians liberated Maidanek in 45, and they'd still have all the records. I'd like to see everything they have on Dieter Krugman. You really think they'll cooperate? Yes, I do. But I'd appreciate it if you keep your inquiry as private as possible. I'll do what I can, but why do you need their files on Krugman? Well, so far I have a lot of questions and very few answers. Maybe the Soviets can supply some. Or maybe not. Yes, he seemed very intense. Very, I say it, menacing. Objection. Calls for a conclusion. Move to strike. Sustained. The witness's answer will be stricken. What exactly did Captain Berman say? He said he wanted to talk to Monsieur Altman about... My Danek, is it? Mm -hmm. Then I left the room. But after I shut the door, I could still hear voices, angry voices. Then what happened? Didier and I, Didier is the receptionist. We heard the shot, and we ran back to the room. We saw the Americans staring down at Monsieur Altman's body. Did you see the gun? Yes, it was on the floor, not far from the body. And this American that you saw, is he here in this courtroom today? We well, seated right over there. Indicating the defendant, Captain Berman. Sir, no further questions. Monsieur Dario, could you tell us if there's another door to that room other than the one leading to the hallway? Yes, it leads to a room that's used for storage. And from there, there is a door leading to the outside. What? Oui. So. It's entirely possible that some other person could have hidden behind that door, shot Monsieur Altman, and then escaped without being seen. It is possible, I suppose, but I didn't see any such person. Thank you, Monsieur Dario. And neither did anyone else. I move that last remark be stricken. The court will please disregard the witness's unsolicited response. No, it's not going too well. But we haven't been up the bat yet. So will you be going right back to the States after the trial? I don't know. Why? Just thought since you were here, you might take some vacation time. Uh, I doubt it. Too many cases pending back home. How about you? How about me what? Oh, you think you'll come back? To the States? Why would I? Well, it was your mother's idea to come here, and, uh, well, you know. I told you, this is my home now. But, uh, what if you were to get involved with some American? Where is it written that a woman has to follow a man? I mean, if a man truly cared, couldn't he think about relocating here? Makes sense, I guess. <laughs> Look, there's something I gotta ask you. Sounds a little ominous. Not really. After your mother died, did you ever try to find Krugman yourself? Why do you want to know? No reason. I mean, it just seems like it would be kind of a natural instinct to want to find Krugman, bring him to justice. Is that what this is all about? You really want to cross-examine me, accuse me of murder? Marie, wait a second. No, you know what you are? You know what your problem is? You're fake. You just don't say what you want. You always have to enter into some stupid little game. Marie, now, wait just, a just second. give me my picture back and leave me alone. All right? Sorry about your picture. 
Depends on what? On whether or not I can see you again. Here or in America? Here for now. <laughs> what I don't understand is why anybody would want that picture so badly. Don't worry about it. The security people at the embassy made me copies yesterday. Good. Give one to Marie. Hello? Yeah, hold on a minute. It's Ambassador Todd. Hold on a minute. Mr. Ambassador? Good. Yes, I hope so, too. And Mr. Ambassador, thank you. Thank you very much. The Russians are cooperating. We should be getting their Krugman file by courier sometime around noon tomorrow. I hope it helps. France may not have the death penalty, but a U.S. court martial does. Well, I, I don't know that I'd call it an obsession. What would you call it? Objection. What she would call it is irrelevant. Sustained. But he arranged to have himself transferred to Paris, made repeated inquiries about Krugman at the Surete, even met with a woman who claimed that she could identify him. Now, surely that was more than just idle curiosity. Objection. Witness is not a psychiatrist. Sustained. Miss Bramwell, isn't it true that the defendant often said that no matter what, he had to find Dieter Krugman? Objection irrelevant and calls for hearsay. No. It goes to state of mind and motive. Overruled, Mr. Mason. You may answer the question, Ms. Bramwell. Yes. That's what he said. No more questions. Ms. Bramwell. What did David tell you was his ultimate objective when he found Krugman? Objection. No foundation or relevancy. Oh, Mr. President, it was Colonel Calvelli's inquiries that opened the door to this subject. Overruled. The witness may answer the question. He wanted a public trial, so everyone in the world would know what Krugman did. Did he ever say... One word, one word about wanting to kill the man. No. Looks like the prosecution will wrap things up this afternoon. Have improved their case. Motive, weapon, opportunity. Here it is, Mr. Mason. Moscow. Our decoding people made a translation for you. Can bring David to the conference room. Does that help? Maybe the break we've been looking for, but I need more help from you. You know my ground rules. No, 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 believe me. Nothing will compromise your neutrality. I want serious cooperation from the local Surete. Well, Mr. Mitchell's been in touch with them. I'm sure he can. No, help. no, no. I, I don't think Kurt can handle this for what I have in mind. The request has to come from the highest level. Besides, there's a question of time. Tell me exactly what you want to do what I can. David, I want your consent to bring your mother here to testify. What for? I mean, you saw her. She's just getting over surgery. I know. We'll make sure she's well taken care of. But what can she do? For starters, she just might save your life. What are you talking about? Who's this? According to the Russians, that's a picture of Dieter Krugman. No, it isn't. Why not? You've seen the picture of Krugman. This isn't the same man. Maybe he had plastic surgery. A lot of those guys did. The 
That is Krugman, right? Yes. Both photos show a man in SS uniform. Now, why would he have had plastic surgery before the war ended? Okay, you're right, he wouldn't. But it doesn't make sense. That's why I need your mother here, to explain the discrepancy. She's very fragile, Mr. Mason. She's always been. She survived my neck. Okay. Yes, I, I talked to the doctor, and he said it's all right for her to travel. But... Matter of fact, I think even if he'd said no, she would have come. That sounds like Helene, all right. When you talk to her, tell her Ken will meet her at the plane and she'll be staying at the Royal Monceau with us. Right, right. Uh, I think you should know, though, Perry. Even with her faith in you, she's still very worried. Oh, well, she's not the only one. But don't tell her that. Perry. Well... Bye, Della. As you heard, I want you to meet Elaine. I booked her on flight 1110, arriving early at noon. Please bring her directly to the embassy. What about the court-martial? Oh, Colonel Butler's giving us a one-day delay. Well, that's good. Good. Elaine's testimony could be the key to this whole case. is a gun, and I will use it if you do not do as I say. Come on, let's go. You have friends arriving here, Meyerhoff? David, is that the man? Yeah, that's him. Sir, you're under arrest. See you more. Don't go now. Mr. Mason. For a second, I thought everything got fouled up. Now what? We just let French justice take its course, head back to the hotel. Back to the hotel? What for? David's mother arrived two hours ago on the Concord. Kathy's with her. train for three days. My mother and father, my two brothers and me, and probably 70 others in one box car, and no food or water the last day and a half. How old were you? Fifteen. My brothers were 14 and 17. Please go on. Finally, at dawn of the fourth day, the train stopped at Maidenek. They forced us to jump off the train. And I saw my mother and father shoved into a group of people and marched away. There were no goodbyes. I learned later they were taken directly to the gas chambers. Then my brothers and I, along with many other children our ages, were marched to some kind of a holding area. My brother Jean went up to this SS man and demanded to know where they had taken our parents. He did not answer, but he, he just raised this iron pipe he carried and smashed Jean to the ground with it. Then my other brother Alan 
ran to the man, and he also was smashed to the ground. And then, then he kept hitting him until he was dead. Somehow, Jean managed to get to his feet, and he he went after the man, tried to knock him down. But the man raised the iron bar to hit Jean again. I grabbed this piece of glass and I ran at him. And I grabbed his hand and cut it as hard as I could. He screamed and shook me away. And then he brought the iron bar down on my knee. Then he went back to Jean and finished his killing. Then he raised the bar over my head. He would have killed me too, but another SS officer arrived and ordered it to move all of us immediately to the work barracks. He called the man with the pipe, Krugman. Opt Sturmführer Krugman. I never saw him again. But I will remember his face until the day I die. Thank you, Miss Berman. I apologize for obliging you to relive that day. Now, I would like you to look at some photographs, if you will. Of course. These are photographs, Mr. President, already admitted into evidence. They are identified in your packets as A, B, and C. Mr. Prosecutor, do you have yours? Mm. Mr. Malansky, photograph A, please. Now, do you recognize that man? Yes, I recognize him. Could you tell us the name of that man? I do not know it, but it is the SS officer who came and ordered Krugman to take us away. He did not mean to, I'm sure, but he saved my life. But the man in that photograph is not Dieter Krugman. No. Photograph B, please. Now, do you recognize the same man in that photograph? Yes, that's him, right there. That man was known as Altman, Mrs. Berman. Felix Altman. But he is here, too. Who is there? Krugman. Right there. Photograph C, please, the Russian photo. And that man? That is also Dieter Krugman? Yes. Yes, that is the monster. That's Krugman. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mrs. Berman. I'm sorry. I have no more questions of this witness. Colonel Calvelli? No question, sir. That's all, madam. We thank you for helping us here today. And we'll take a 10-minute recess. Captain Berman, get permission to assist your mother. Yes, my husband's business was failing. What did he do about that? He was désespéré. He went to everyone he knew to borrow money. To find some money to keep the business going. Did he succeed? No. Madame Altman, I have a few more questions. But I must remind you that you are still under oath. Oui, I know. Madame, what was your husband's real name? Felix Meinheim. 
But he changed it to Altman. He did not want anyone to know he'd been stationed at Madnik. Then why did you lie? Why did you tell the authorities and the press after he died that your husband was really Dieter Krugman? Because someone threatened to kill me. And since Felix had been murdered, I did believe they would try to kill me too. Who, Madame Altman? Who threatened to kill you? A man named Karl Meyerhoff. What is your relationship to Otto Rosen? I work for him. And on his orders, did you kidnap David Berman? Yes. On his orders, did you follow and electronically eavesdrop on Miss Catherine Bramwell? Yes. On his orders, did you threaten Danielle Altman's life? Yes, but of course I would not have done it. On his orders, did you kill Elsa Ramsey? No, I've never killed anybody. I see. Tell me, Mr. Meyerhoff, why were you waiting for Helene Berman at the airport yesterday? All Rosen told me was that he wanted to talk to her before she appeared at this trial. So you were just going to spirit her off. And Rosen was just going to talk to her. That's what he said. Mr. Meyerhoff, did you know that Felix Altman was not Dieter Krugman? I only knew what Rosen told me. Did you kill Felix Altman? No. Do you know who did? No, but it wasn't me. I wasn't even in Paris that day. You can verify that. I already have. No further questions. Colonel Calvelli? No questions, sir. Defense calls Otto Rosen. Mr. Rosen, you do understand that your friend Meyerhoff has just testified. Uh, yes. When your friend Meyerhoff called you to set up our meeting, I noted the number he punched on his mobile phone. I called that number the next day, found it was the office of a very prestigious brokerage house here in Paris. Really, uh, perhaps you made a mistake with the number, huh? Mr. Rosen, when we met, I asked why you were working underground. You gave me several answers, none of which I found satisfactory. I did some research. I found there'd been no bombing of any office in West Berlin three years ago, and that Mr. Wiesenthal had never heard of an Otto Rosen. Then came the question of identities. I'm grateful to the Russians for helping me sort it all out. Perhaps you will not be. I have no idea what you're talking about. Neither do I, Mr. President, and I must object to this whole line of inquiry as irrelevant. Irrelevant? Mr. President, the testimony of this witness is the essential part of our defense. And evidently, the defense is based on blue sky instead of on hard evidence. Mr. President, again, this is all irrelevant to the defendant's guilt or innocence. I assure the court, even the skeptical colonel, that the relevancy will quickly become apparent. Overall. Mr. Rosen, I submit that the office where we met was a total fake. A piece of theater you designed to convince me that you were a Jew and a Nazi hunter. Well, why... I submit, Herr Rosen, that you were and are neither. Why should you say that? I'm Otto Rosen, and I have been a Nazi hunter for 44 years. I submit, Herr Rosen, that your real name is Krugman. Dieter Krugman. Dieter Krugman, you're insane. I'm Otto Rosen. Mr. President, I beg this court's indulgence. I wish to bring into this interrogation at this time a witness, an expert witness, purely for the purposes of identification. Go ahead, Mr. Mason. Mr. Molansky. 
Otto Rosen. Dieter Krugman. I submit it was you who ordered Felix Altman killed and had his wife threatened. That is a terrible lie. You and Altman knew each other. You knew each other was here in Paris, both successful businessmen. You felt safe, didn't you? For one to betray the other, he would have to betray himself. But when Altman's business began to collapse, he became desperate. He came to you. He demanded money. Demanded money or he'd reveal your true identity. For Felix Altman, that was suicide. It's an interesting theory, Mr. Mason, but it's a pity you have no proof for such wild charges. <laughs> I call the court's attention to the file from Russia, entered as Defense Exhibit 3. You will note the description of Dieter Krugman. It includes the fact that he has a scar across the back of his right hand. Well, Mr. Rosen, I would like you to show the court your right hand. You've no right to ask me anything. I'm a French citizen. Show the court your right hand. Turn it over. I wonder if that scar could have been made by a jagged piece of glass in the hands of a little girl some 45 years ago. Now, would you please remove your glasses? Remove your glasses. Mrs. Berman, do you recognize that man? Yes. The eyes of the devil, Krugman. I have no further questions of the witness. I have no questions, sir. I'm going to excuse this witness and suggest the Surete take him into immediate custody. Mr. President, in view of the fact that the prosecution has made a prima facie case against the defendant, that insufficient evidence has been produced to contradict any element of that case, I move for a directed verdict of guilty of murder in the first degree. I ask the court to defer ruling on that motion until after the testimony of my final witness. Mr. President, defense counsel continues to play his excruciating little delaying game, tantalizing us with this whole parade of mysterious witnesses, none of whom have disproved in the slightest the case against the defendant. Uh, Mr. President, this case is much more complicated than Colonel Calvelli seems able to comprehend, certainly more complicated than any of us would wish. The charge against the defendant is very serious. I believe the court should give us every reasonable opportunity to prove his innocence. Mr. Mason, Colonel Calvelli's motion is somewhat irregular, but the point is well taken. If defense has some strong evidence to present us soon, let's hear it. Yes, sir. Call your next witness. Isn't it true, Mr. Mitchell, that although Ambassador Todd assigned you to work with Mr. Melansky and myself, it was you who asked for the assignment? Yes, of course I did. David's a good friend of mine. And you? Are you a good friend of David's? Excuse me? I can't excuse you. You know, a lot of things bothered me about this case. For instance, how did Meyerhoff know the defendant was going out to dinner the night he was kidnapped? How did the photo thief know Mr. Melansky was going to return the picture 
to Miss Ramsey that day. And how did Elsa Ramsey's killer know she had recognized Krugman on the street? According to her daughter, the only people she talked to were the Surete and the defendant. Suddenly, a great light hit me. You. You were the only one who knew all these things. Because as David's friend, he confided in you. To be sure, you were the contact. I let you make the travel arrangements for David's mother. Sure enough, there was Carl Meyerhoff waiting for her at the airport. The right time, the right gate. You're way off base, Mr. Mason. I had nothing to do with Rosen or Krugman or whatever his name is. How long have you been in Paris, Mr. Mitchell? Eleven years. Why? Eleven years. You recognize this? It looks like a paper napkin. And on it is your handwriting, is it not? I suppose so. Suppose? Is it your handwriting or is it not? It is. Those are the directions you wrote down for the defendant the day he drove out to the spa to see Felix Altman. So? So, you've lived in Paris for 11 years. And yet you give your friend directions that will take him at least 20 minutes longer than necessary. That's not true. Not true? Not true, Mr. Mitchell? All right, maybe I made a mistake. No mistake. You gave David Berman faulty directions. You gave yourself time to get to his apartment. Steal his gun, proceed him to the spa, and lie in wait to kill Felix Altman. What possible reason would I have to kill Altman? Mr. Mitchell, on your personnel records, you're listed as the son of Wilhelm and Gisela Mitchell. Married in Milwaukee in 1956. Gisela, maiden name Kraus, immigrated to the United States in 1954. But your age here is listed as 37. That means that you're not the actual son of Wilhelm Mitchell, but a child of Gisela's from a former marriage. I would like to introduce into evidence a certified copy of a birth certificate obtained from the West German government. It lists the birth of one Kurt Johann Krugman, son of Gisela Kraus Krugman and Hans Krugman. In other words, Mr. Mitchell, you are the blood nephew of Dieter Krugman and a member of Odessa. That is a lie. That is a lie. Ein Mitglied von Odessa. Ja! Ich bin ein Krugmann. Und ich bin ein Top-Mitglied von Odessa. Und Sie werden sterben. You will die. Okay. Yes, sir. I move for a directed verdict of not guilty. Motion granted. The defendant is free to go. Hurt you. You're going to have to stick around a few days to fill in those blanks for the Surete. No problem. You ready? My bags are already in the taxi. I'll get mine. What are you talking about? Business. I have to go. Well, what about... I, I mean... Hell, this isn't fair. Well, I might still be there when you get back. Marie, if you think I'm going to let you get away without kissing your goodbye, you're crazy. Taxi. Taxi. 
Tate.